Hey y'all, how you doing? Hope you're having a good day. Today I'm going to be starting a series on vibrational spectroscopy, and first of all we'll discuss infrared, or IR spectroscopy. So to start off, just know that molecules are always vibrating. They never stop vibrating. The ways in which molecules can vibrate are called normal modes. Take a uh, simple molecule such as water, for instance. Now it's an oxygen with a bond to a hydrogen over here and another hydrogen over here. And there's three different ways water can vibrate. So if you think of them, one is both of these bonds being elongated that way which is called a symmetric stretch. Another way it can vibrate is one bond could stretch, that bond could stretch, and this bond could compress. And then the last way the molecule can vibrate are both bonds could squeeze together. So both of the hydrogen atoms could, well, either approach each other or they could move away from each other. It's the same vibration. So notice there's three different ways water can vibrate. Three normal modes, you would say. Three normal modes. And in general, if you have n atoms, then the number of normal modes are 3n minus 6. So there's 3n minus 6 number of ways a molecule can vibrate. Unless it's linear, then this is 5. So the rule is 3n minus 5 for linear molecules. And you might ask, where's this 5 or this 6 come from? So this is the total number of degrees of... Well, 3n is the number of degrees of freedom. 3n is degrees of freedom. And a molecule can translate in three ways. So there's three translation degrees of freedom. It can go forward, backwards, up, down, or left and right. There's three ways of rotating. And I think you can picture that. If you have a triangle, it won't work with a rod because there's only two ways um, for a linear molecule to rotate. But if you have a triangle, it can sort of... Let's draw a triangle. It can sort of rotate this way. It can flip over on itself this way. Or it can... rotate diagonally yeah like this <sighs> kind of because it has three sides but only two for linear so for linear let's take a rectangle now it can flip over long ways or it can flip over short ways <sighs> but flipping over diagonally is just a combination of this way and this way and then finally, um, the rest of the degrees of freedom are vibrational degrees of freedom. Now, let's take an example molecule. And we note that molecules with dipoles are going to interact with electric fields because the simple rule you've heard all your life, positive, Charges are attracted to negative charges, and negative charges are attracted to positive charges. So, let's take a molecule not in an E field. Let's take the molecule carbon monoxide. So we draw carbon monoxide like this, where the oxygen has a slight positive charge and the carbon has a slight minus charge. So you can kind of think of it is just positive and minus charge. It does have a dipole, and the dipole points that way. 
so the bond might be this long in not in an electric field. But let's point the electric field up. And to make an electric field, you can have a bunch of positive charges up here and a bunch of minus charges down here. So we put that molecule in there, what's going to happen? Well, the oxygen that's positively charged is going to be repelled from these positive charges and this negative charge is going to be repelled from those negative charges. So the bond's going to be shorter. It's going to look something like that. Notice this bond is shorter than that bond. Now let's point the electric field down. So that would be like you have a bunch of minus charges up there, a bunch of plus charges down here. And if the molecule is facing the same way, well the positive charge is going to be attracted to these negative charges, so the oxygen is going to lie up there. Carbon has a negative charge going to be attracted to this positive charge, so it's going to lie down here. Now, I'm very exaggerating this, but the bond's going to be longer. So you see no E field, it's like this. E field going up, it's short. E field going down, it's long. And electromagnetic radiation is basically an E field going up and down very, very fast. So if you put this molecule in the right frequency of electromagnetic radiation, well then it's going to vibrate this bond up and down really, really fast. And even without an electric field, the bond is vibrating at its natural frequency. So here it has a natural frequency, we'll call it omega naught. And if the E field, we'll say the E field has a frequency omega E. Now absorption occurs, we get absorption of the electromagnetic radiation when omega E equals omega naught. It's sort of like a resonance effect. If you are pushing a child on a swing, and the child's swinging at some natural frequency, well, if you push at that natural frequency, the child's gonna go higher and higher. But if you push at a frequency that's different, you're gonna basically make the child stop swinging. And so the natural vibration of the bond just follows a harmonic oscillator type vibration. And I've discussed that in another video. Now let's talk about the energies at which these bonds vibrate. So by doing a lot of quantum mechanical math, which I'm not going to show here, you can determine that the energy of a vibration, E sub V, is equal to some integer V plus a half times H Planck's constant times nu the frequency, well the natural frequency. So this is the, this is not the E field, this is the energy now. The energy of vibration V is equal to this. So let's take the energy, and V can be zero. So the lowest energy is when V is zero, so we get half times H nu naught. E1 would be three over two H nu naught. E2, 5 over 2, H nu naught, so on and so forth. And you can see the difference between these different energies is just H nu naught. It's the same between each consecutive energy level. It's always H naught. And if you think of a potential energy well, which is shaped like that, where you have your energy on the y-axis and you have the bond distance on this axis let's call the bond distance R bond distance so this would be an electronic potential energy well and I've discussed it in previous videos 
Now down here we might have v equals 0, here we would have v equals 1, here v equals 2, so on and so forth. But as you go higher up, the energy levels actually get closer and closer together, and since you're approaching this asymptote here, they basically become infinitely close way up here. But down here, they're pretty much equally spaced apart. So the distance between these is delta E, and that's H nu naught. Because V0 lies at E0, which we showed up there, and this state lies at E1, so on and so forth. And so this is the bond distance. And the reason it's shaped like this is because if you try to push the bond to make it really, really short, well, eventually the nuclei are going to feel each other and start repelling each other with a very strong force. That's what is happening over here. You're trying to push two positive charges together, and they're going to repel each other with great force. And over here, it dies off like this because as you pull the charges apart... Well, the positive charge and minus charge are going to want to be together, so it's going to want to be at the this position all the way down here naturally. But as you pull them apart, um, you're sort of losing some potential energy, and that's why it dies off here. But as they get further and further apart, there's less and less of an effect. And this is sometimes called a Morse potential. And often it's... It's uh, approximated by a harmonic potential that's just shaped, shaped exactly like a parabola. So if it was shaped exactly like a parabola, then you would always have these energy levels equally spaced. And they would never get close together. But in real life, it's actually shaped like this Morse potential rather than a harmonic oscillator potential. Now this distance here, so the bond's vibrating back and forth but, and like basically bouncing off these walls here. And the natural position is called R, R naught. It's just the equilibrium bond distance. So if you look up the bond distance for carbon monoxide, for example, the number that's going to re be reported is the equilibrium bond distance because the bond distance is really a function of, um, well, time, for one, and a few other things. The bond distance is oscillating back and forth, but the average bond distance um, is R naught. A couple other things to notice with this graph. On the right side here, notice you have long bonds, and on the left you have short bonds. And as you get more and more closely spaced, as you go up here, this is called anharmonicity, because, which basically means it's not harmonic anymore. You can see it deviates further and further from an exact harmonic oscillator. So at low levels, the harmonic oscillator is a pretty good approximation. At high levels, it's bad. And there's things called selection rules in vibrational spectroscopy. And the selection rules for infrared spectroscopy are that the dipole of the molecule must change. So essentially, you can write that in a math form that says the change in the dipole moment with the change in the normal coordinate Q, which you can kind of think of as the bond distance R, must not be zero. It has to have some value to go between one state and another. And in infrared, um, if you do a bunch of math, you find out you can only jump between consecutive states. So you can only go between 0 and 1. You can't go between 0 and 2 or 0 and 3. So that's the selection rule. 
So that was basic introduction to vibrational spectroscopy. Hope you enjoyed that, and have a great day.